Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I am your host, Mr. Veda Hedgeman of Is He A Real One Radio. I want to welcome you and say hi. If you are watching on YouTube, I want to wave at you and say, hey, you're looking at my face. I can't see yours. If you are listening on iHeartRadio, we want to thank you so much in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for listening. If you are listening on Spotify, if you're listening on iTunes, if you are listening on the TuneIn app, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. And on today, we have an awesome, awesome guest, very educated guest, uh, an awesome student of God's word and an awesome teacher of God's word as well by Mr. Tom Gilson. OK, we will be discussing his latest book. It is a very good book. I'm so honored to have been able to read through it. I haven't read through each and every portion of it, but the parts I've read were awesome and I, and I highly recommend it. So on today, we are interviewing uh, Mr. Tom Gilson. He is the author of six books, including the book that we will be discussing today, which is called Too Good to Be False. Now, not only is he a theologian and a student slash teacher of God's word, but he is also a music man. All right. He has his bachelor's mm -hmm. in music. You know, he plays the trombone and, <clears throat> you know, and he had music education, went to Michigan State University. And he has over 30 hours of graduate level theology courses with the International School of Theology, Western Seminary and Talbot Seminary. OK, so without further ado, I would love to introduce today's guest. Today's guest. I'm sorry, Mr. Tom Gilson. How are you doing, sir? I am fine. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to be here. Oh, man, it is a pleasure to have you. And I'm really excited to discuss some stuff about this book. Uh, before we even get there, though, uh, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about yourself, some things that you want us to know about you to, you know, just to set the context and all this stuff about the conversation we're having? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm the husband of one, wonderful wife named Sarah, father of two, two grown kids, um, both married. One of them has our first grandchild on the way. And we're praying that we'll uh, come, Congratulations. come healthy. Come healthy in January. Um, they are. Uh, we just love our kids. They're both walking with the Lord. We, uh, my wife and I, live near Dayton, Ohio, where um, where I work in my home office. She works at a sporting goods store. Mm -hmm. um, and above all, we both love the Lord. We've been following the Lord since before we knew each other and married 33 years in just a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Yeah. I think that is awesome. So what is, before we get to the details of the book, you know, one of the reasons yeah. why I like the book a lot is because it's not solely an apologetic book. You know, right. you cover right. theology first. I think that sometimes us apologists, you know, we can get so, history crazy and secular resources crazy that we don't spend yeah. enough time you know on on the bible and i think you did a really good time of making sure that's included especially on the you know in the intro in the intro of it right you know before you even got into uh, some of the arguments that you wanted to get to you made sure you laid the foundation of who right. jesus is why it's important and the context of jesus's life death and resurrection but what why are you even interested in apologetics like what what happened to where that was even part of your life or your or your studies yeah where i started with apologetics i was a freshman at michigan state and um and and i had done as a as a high school kid even younger i I'd, I'd i grew up in church and i was trying to follow Jesus. i was trying to be a christian and what i discovered is you can't try to be a christian and succeed what i what i experienced all the way along was just failure i'd, I'd lay in bed at night and going yeah and i don't think i'm really good enough christian i don't think i'm there and I wasn't. So it, it got so frustrating, I gave up. I just thought, you know, what's the point? Well, I went to Michigan State as a freshman, as I said, and I had a couple of friends on the dorm floor who were Christians and seemed to be enjoying it. And that intrigued me. And I thought, I, I thought I proved you couldn't do that. Hmm. Well, they, they got me going uh, with a book. This was in 1974, a book that was very current at the time. It was Josh McDowell's Evidence that Demands a Verdict. Ah, still I read is. This book it's and I was convinced. I was convinced, and so it was. We we went to church one Sunday night in January, and I, I said, okay, I believe. I just don't know how to make it take. 
hmm. which was what they knew when I said that is I needed to know how to trust Christ by faith. Well, Josh was a big part of my coming to Christ. Shortly after that, just two months later, he was on campus at Michigan State. And the guys who led me to Christ were part of the leadership team bringing them there. And the students at MSU, the Campus Crusade for Christ students that, that hosted them, did it right. There was an, all kinds of prayer. There was all kinds of uh, energy to it. And there was all kinds of teaching. And I just got, I just got into it uh, the right way immediately. Plus, I, I, I tend to have a, a curious mind. And so apologetics was, was interesting from the very beginning. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting stuff, man. So, yeah. you, you know, so getting into the book a little bit, you know, too yeah. good to be false. Right. So let, let before we get to the details of it, let's tell us about the book and how did you end up even writing the book? What does it mean? What is it about? As I see what you have What does it the, mean? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's about the greatness and the goodness of Jesus, which I started looking at this when I was blogging on it years ago, um, seven or eight years ago. And, um, and it just occurred to me, I don't know how, but it, but it occurred to me that Jesus' love is underestimated by most Christians. It was by me. I realized that that Jesus, as portrayed in a story, let's just talk about the story. And, and I can even talk about this in terms where, where skeptics and atheists can say, okay, it's the story, it's a story. And I'll say, okay, this is the character in the story. This character, whether you believe it's true or not, this is the story of a man who is incredibly powerful. Right. I mean, he wants it, he's got it. The story has him creating the universe. That's really powerful, okay? Right. And that story has him, um, you know, feeding 5,000 out of a one boy's lunch, has him he, raising people from the dead, changing the weather. This is one powerful man. And I thought, you know, there's powerful people in stories everywhere. There's powerful people in history. There's powerful people in mythology, gods. There's, right. there's powerful superheroes. But then this is what floored me is when I realized that this powerful person in this story, this Jesus used his power for others mm. all the time. Right. There is no case where Jesus used his power, his extraordinary power for his own benefit. Right. And that just floored me. I thought, what if, what if I got, some incredible power. And the only kind that's realistically imaginable is money. So suppose someone, um, so suppose someone, someone won, won Powerball and, and decided I deserved the money. <laughs> and I had, you know, half a billion dollars. And I was like a really, really, really good person. And I wanted to give it all the missions and to feed the poor and to stop, you know, human trafficking and all this good stuff. Could I imagine doing that without taking my wife out for a nice dinner on it? Right. Could right. I imagine myself being so good? I can't. Look, Jesus this, is really amazing Tom, because he's got all this power. Tom, look, yeah. and, and then to go along with, with, with the example you're saying, and then you're doing it to people who don't appreciate it. You do it to You do it for people who don't appreciate it. <laughs> Bonhoeffer called him the man for others, and and he was without exception. He uh -huh. was there for others. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, okay, he is beyond me. He is way beyond me. He is unimaginably beyond me. I knew for decades that there was a doctrine that said that Jesus was God and that it was okay to worship him. But when I realized how, how incredibly self-sacrificially giving he was, how much greater than I could ever be in that, that's when I fell to my knees, fell to the floor and said, oh my God, in all reverence, you are my God. Hmm. Man. You, so that was, that's actually pretty much the first chapter, second chapter of the book after the intro is, is where I replay that. But then I looked at some other factors in Jesus' life and he's, there's all kinds of ways he's more amazing than I realized. Right. So this is a, first and foremost, a book to honor Jesus and his greatness, which has been 
incredibly fun to study. <laughs> it's just been a blast. Yeah. You know, you touched on something that you actually mentioned in your book when you, in using your analogy, you know, yeah. about, you know, say if you were to, you know, get a lot of money or whatever, for example, right. in your book, you actually, you actually use, you know, that example about where you would ask people to list the most powerful people who they can think of or the most powerful right. people who they can imagine. Mm -hmm. then, then you ask them to name the most uh, self-sacrificial people who they can imagine. Right. They never list the same people, right? You no, know, they, they, the they, 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 right, like they never list the same people. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, there. And how that and how that relates to our conversation about Jesus. Yeah. A couple famous things. One by uh, Lord Acton. He said, uh, "Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power, absol um, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Hmm. There is this effect where power will corrupt people." Abraham Lincoln said, "Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power." And Hmm. And, and, and so people, when they get power, tend to go bad. They tend to use it for themselves. They tend not to be giving. So when you find a person who has power and uses it for others, you found someone very unique. I mean, even if we, I, I know you've been married for, for about 30 years, but even yeah. if you think about people, and, I, and I've been married for four, going on four, you know, right. I'm, I'm getting up, I'm, I'm trying to get up there, you know, but <laughs> nevertheless, when we think about people who are dating or we talk to friends or whatnot, if someone's too nice or too good, you know, we almost get skeptical, right? It's like, wait a minute, you know, yeah. like, like what's wrong with you? Like, like, no, I'm, I'm going to wait because something's wrong with you. Right. But Jesus, right. but Jesus lived the perfect life, the perfect life. Matter of fact, speaking of that, and, and I'll let you respond, but yeah. I even love uh, the part of your book where you were talking about, okay, imagine a leader who owns up to his or her mistakes. Great leader. I can follow right. that person, right? right? Imagine a leader who, 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 who learns from the mishaps that he or she did. Okay, great. I can learn from that leader. That yeah. leader is a great example, <laughs> and, I, and, I right. can and I can follow them. But Jesus is even better than that. He ain't make no mistakes. He's perfect. And man, I'm about to start. Right. I always do that. Go ahead. There's got to be something, and, and this I wonder is part of the reason not everybody followed him there, is that there's got to be something that's unsettling about being around that kind of goodness. Yeah, mm. it's, there's got to be something really uncomfortable. As I wrote in the book, I can imagine even Mary and Joseph raising him and, and talking to each other and saying, you know, even though they know Jesus' miraculous origins, that, you know, he was he was not normal. He was born when Mary was a virgin. And, and so they knew that he was different, but I can imagine them saying to themselves, you know, honey, I, I thought it was our job to teach our, our kids how to, how to love, but, but why do I get the sense he's teaching us? Mm. There's, you know, it would be good, but it would be unsettling. It would be disturbing. And I don't think we really understand Jesus unless we unless we come to grips with the disturbing part of his goodness. He doesn't, for example, he doesn't love us much as we want to. In our pride, we want to be loved because we're lovable. You know, we want someone to say, I love you because you're lovable. Jesus won't do that. He'll say, I love because I love. Mm. And that's his greatness. That's his goodness. That's the worth he places on us. It's not our, it's not our goodness. So we have to come to grips with his, with how different he is, how much more loving he is, how much he does, loves differently than other people we're used to. Now, you, you talked about the impossible legend of Jesus. So right. you and I, you know, we're both followers of Jesus Christ. So we start talking about Jesus and then we didn't already, you know, went, right. you know, went, went crazy just talking about the goodness of Jesus, right? That's right. awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But if if a person is a non-believer and they somehow listen through our conversation so far nauseated and they're like right. Look at that. like <laughs> right. Right. Sure. Yeah. you know and they're like listen to these two guys who sound so smart when they talk yet they're talking about <laughs> this made up story you know but you right. have a sure. portion of your book where you talk about the impossible legend of Jesus that's right why, why yeah. is it impossible yeah, someone on, on, a, on the stream, by the way, I write for a website called The Stream. I want to let you know about that. Stream.org. It's a, it's a, 
I think, the go-to place for a Christian perspective on current events. And someone there, uh, we do timeless stuff too, including apologetics. And someone there commented on this topic and they said, sounds like you're writing hagiography, which means you're writing exaggerated stories about somebody who isn't really isn't that good. And I said, no, this is, this is someone who's really that good. But there it is that kind of sense of, you know, what are you talking about? You know, is it even true? Well, here's the thing. There is the legend theory. You know, here's, the, I do this fun thing in the book. I say, let's agree with the atheists on a couple of things. One, it's a story. Okay, right. Can we agree right. on it? It's a right. story. And can we agree that stories come from somewhere? Yeah, we can go that way. And can we agree that, that, that your backstory, where the story came from, has to match the story? Right. So that if you've got the backstory that doesn't fit the story, you got to look at what's wrong. How, there's, a, there's a mismatch here. Well, the backstory that the atheists put on the Gospels, typically, very commonly, is that it's a legend. And the way the legend started was that these, these followers of Jesus, who was a real person, got really, you know, fired up for him, but then he died. And they were disappointed. He was supposed to be their king, their Messiah, and they were lost. And how are they going to recover? And so, uh, and I won't go into the cognitive dissonance reduction theory part, although it's kind of interesting. I'll leave that for, the, for you to read the book. Right. But what they did is they invented a resurrection so that Jesus could still be their Messiah even after he died. You know, pretty convenient. Works, right? And then he started telling the story and the story spread and people told the story and they told other people and they told other people a telephone game. Bart Ehrman writes about this more than anybody, the telephone game. He's got it in four or five of his books. He's a very mm -hmm. prominent skeptic author. And, you know, he's sold jillions of books on this kind of a thing and he talks about the telephone game and he says you spread the story around from country to country in multiple languages around the whole mediterranean and what happens to the story it changes well, i look at that and i go no that's too wimpy a word for it the story when it spreads that way through this through this you know one person after another oral tradition is bound to get corrupted right it's not just change. It's not just the change on the level that the atheists talk about, like how many angels were there really at the tomb? <laughs> you gotta expect some major changes. Amen. And Brilliant. corruption, it's bound to get messed up. And the thing, that, the thing that they don't deal with, and this is the point of the second of three parts in my book, Jesus is not a corrupted character at all. There is... And in, 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 in the first part of the book, I detail five, six, seven ways in which Jesus is amazingly unique and good and consistent. Right. And in all four Gospels, he's amazingly unique and good and consistent. And the backstory that the legend theorists give for the Gospels doesn't fit the story. You don't expect the most amazingly unique consistent, loving, perfect character in all literature hmm. to be produced by a corrupting process. Hmm. It, yeah. it just, that, that, that don't make no happen. sense. Right. Yeah. yeah, that don't make no sense. It doesn't. <laughs> People have looked at what they thought were mess ups in the plot. And they're, they're small mess ups. But you know, it's like, did Jairus come or did he send a servant to have his daughter healed? Um, how many angels at the tomb? Uh, how many times did Jesus cleanse a temple? These are plot points. And, and they look at that and they say, that got messed up. And they missed the fact that the central character in the story is completely consistent and unique and good without fail. Hmm. You know, you, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned some of Bart Ehrman's arguments, because that's actually where I was going to go next. Okay. Aside, you know, so aside from him having, and, and by the way, I, I don't want to take it for granted. So, so if, uh, if there's anyone listening who's not very familiar with Dr. Bart Ehrman, he is an agnostic non-believer who mm -hmm. has who has written several books attempting to dismiss the Christian faith and debunk the Christian faith. Okay, and you know, he's debated a bunch of you know Christian scholars. It's 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 what he does, right? You know, right. That, that, that's what he does. 
Now, he, in, in one of the, like you said, Tom, you know, one of his favorite arguments is the whole telephone game thing where, right. where it's, it, it, let me put it this way. You know, if I'm in the back of a classroom and you know it's a it's a class it's a large class with 60 students you know before the coronavirus of course and i'm sitting in the back and i and i mm-hmm. write something down on a piece of paper and we're trying to pass it all the way down to the front the idea is you know the message that i wrote will get corrupted or it'll be so corrupted it'll be so changed by the time it gets to the person at the very front that whatever i wrote in the beginning will be nearly right. impossible to even know what we wrote in, in the beginning. But yeah, especially you know, if, if the way you pass it along is, you know, by, you know, speaking into the next person's ear. Right. And then right. That would be better. Person. Right. Yeah. Right. But how do we know but but how do but how do we know that that's not the case with with scripture, with the New Testament? Well, it I think it's um, there's actually lots of reasons and the one that I've got in this book just adds to a long list of reasons. There's it's been a, a whole history of, of scholarship on the legend theory. The biggest problem with the legend theory, um, other than what I, th- I think is a big one that I wrote in this book, the biggest one uh, proposed to date is that legends take time to develop. And right, right. we have in particular with the, the, the key event in the gospels, we have in 1 Corinthians 15 verses three through six, we have the, the earliest recorded mention of the resurrection and scholars now are placing that within a few months to a few years after the events and and legends of that magnitude do not develop in less than a couple of generations they do not develop in three to in three months six months three years five years they 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 don't the time just doesn't allow for it so that's the first reason that I, I think for a long time, uh, conservative scholars have rejected the legend theory. And that, but, but my uh, additional argument in here, which is actually new to this generation, is that the legend theory just doesn't fit the story. There, there's a complete mismatch between the story and the backstory. So that just adds to it. There's, there's other reasons besides, you know, I could list a whole lot of them. Those are, right. those are two. Right. And I'm sure you have articles on it, maybe even books on it and different things. Yep. And we have things on this very channel, you know, that's all about it. You know, we have stuff about mm-hmm. the historical reliability of the New Testament. You know, we have Peter Gurry on. If you're listening, you know, check out uh, my video where I covered the manus- the early manuscripts and the uh, the amount that we have, you know, of New Testament scripture. And then right. later on, you know, uh, we had Dr. Peter Gurry on, you know, who, who, who co-authored a book, you know, Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism, where he talked about how, you know, a lot of apologists, we might overstate certain arguments or say certain things out of context, but he was just saying how we can share that evidence and do so as accurately as possible. So if anyone is wondering about the plethora of arguments that Tom is mentioning that we don't have time to go deep into, you know, you can just go through the episode list on, on Is Here Ruin Radio and check out my presentation on the historical reliability of the New Testament and also my interview with Dr. Peter Gurry. Now, oh. now I, I, wanna, I, I wanna ask you a little bit about, about Jesus's world changing mission because I actually have, yeah. a, I have a thought on this and this played a part on me when, when I was a, a non-believer, you know, mm-hmm. and, and agnostic leaning towards atheism for most of my life. And Jesus's world changing mission played a large part in, in me accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and my savior, because as a intellectual doubter, I was never a hostile unbeliever Tom, but I always had questions. No one shared the gospel with me. I was just like, someone's walking on water. I don't even know much about the story, but I know people don't walk on water. So therefore whatever's in that book called the Bible was fake. That was my thing. Yeah. You know, but, but as I studied more, and I just thought about the how incredibly unreasonable it is to think that so many people would convert to followers of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. after Jesus died, yeah. being preached to by mostly Jews, especially at first. Yeah. It, it's, it's, and, and our benefit of becoming a Christian at that time is what? 
you and I know that it's eternal life, right? Yeah. <laughs> you sure. know, yeah. and, and they're being saved from their own wicked ways. But as far as it's not like they got a lot of money. It's not like it was checks being cut in the year AD 43 for those who wanted to sign up <laughs> to be one of the first few Christian preachers or whatever, you know? Right. So I just, I just think it's remarkably unreasonable to think mm -hmm. that, A, it's a legend for that reason. And also right. the magnitude of which it spread from the I different know. nations, the different cultures, you know? So, yeah. So can, can you elaborate on that? I know you talked sure. about the world changing mission. And, and I, I talk about it from the perspective of the story in the gospels before all this came to pass. But isn't it remarkable that Jesus pursued this mission from the very beginning? <laughs> Never wavered. He could have been knocked off course. His family tried to knock him off course. The, the Jewish leaders tried to knock him off course. Satan tried to knock him off course. He didn't waver for a second. And all the way to the end he he had his mission which was uh to teach to to die for our sins but also to 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 send his disciples you know a small small band you know just 12 close ones and uh, you know maybe right maybe right. 120 were there in the upper room 500 saw them later on but that's a pretty small group he said you guys are going to change the entire world Right. In Matthew 24, 14, he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a testimony to all the nations. He told them to go to all the nations at the end of Matthew. And he, and he expected it. And here's the crazy thing. He was right. <laughs> you know, it's easy to say, do this. It's, it's another thing to have it go and go and go and go and go and go and spread and spread for two millennia. Right. And, no, and I, that's, that's not bad work. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know, you mentioned, you know, colleagues like Lydia McGrew. I love her work on yeah. design coincidences, you know, th things like that, you know, also, you know, play a part in it because it's not like a group of people. It's not like me, Tom and two other people said, hey, let's write 66 books together right now and claim that, oh. you know, you're over here like it. When you actually understand what the Bible is, just historically yeah. speaking, even if you want to take a Bart Ehrman's approach, because I was once at least somewhat leaning towards there. And it's just like, let me just understand what the Bible is, what the Old Testament is, what the New Testament yeah. is. Mm -hmm. They did not have text message. I can text you right now. Paul couldn't text Peter. You know, yep. <laughs> you know, Paul couldn't say, hey, you got uh, Peter's number. So I just uh, I just got knocked off a donkey and I had an, uh, you know, I had a run in with Jesus and I want to call them and see if that's the same thing. No, yeah. <laughs> he no, spread no. the gospel, ran into them and mm -hmm. spoke to them about it. And they added nothing to what he had already heard. Right. right. Yeah, and right, right. we see stuff like this in different accounts. We see Luke cover it in the book of Acts. We see Paul cover it in the book of Galatians. And they're not even, and they're not even trying to, you know, necessarily yeah. talk about the same story. They're telling two different stories, but while they're telling two different stories, they cover the same they're events. Telling the same story. <laughs> they're yeah. telling the same story, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I tell you too that there's, there's this thing among among skeptics. They'll say that the book of you know, Bart Ehrman has a, even has a book called How Jesus Became God. Became and God, yeah. About how the theology developed over time. Jesus' deity is taught in the book of John because John was written decades later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it wasn't there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we got a different Jesus in the book of John. Lydia McGrew's putting together a whole new volume on this. Man, I can't wait to see it. But... But, but the part about Jesus' deity not being in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, um, I'm sorry, but when even in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, um, he, he talks about, you have heard that it was said, and then he'll say something, he'll say, but I say to you, if he had been anybody else, look at the Old Testament prophets, it would have been, you have heard what it was said, but the Lord says to you. He never... He never turned to any other source of authority but himself. Right. Uh, the prophet said, thus says the Lord. Jesus said, I say. They were both, the prophet spoke for God, quoting God. Jesus spoke for God on his own terms. 
the only way he could do that is if he was God. And then you, at the end of the Beatitudes, he talks about, you know, you're blessed if you're, um, if you're persecuted for my name because they persecuted the prophets of God in the old days. And what he's saying there is, he's not saying that I'm like the prophets. He's saying I'm like God. The prophets were persecuted for, for following God. You'll be persecuted for following me. And it's the same thing. The That's same Jesus thing. talking about his deity very early. It's all over the first three gospels too. It's just not quite as explicit but boy is it there no it, it, it's there and we can't yeah. spend a lot of time on it but i'll just mention one more in the very beginning of mark's gospel you know in the, just the first few uh, verses you know where it says the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ and it says as it is written in isaiah the prophet then it mm -hmm. lists something that's in isaiah behold i send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way talking about john preparing the way for the messiah who on ever, who who is this john prepared the way for jesus so when he says john appeared baptizing in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance it's talking about yeah. jesus so bar airman read your bible <laughs> I know. yeah <laughs> read it right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so so uh so yeah man th th this is this is awesome stuff man this this is awesome i'm i'm really uh, interested in hearing hearing you elaborate more about the likelihood or point of someone inventing the god man i thought that was a really interesting uh question that you asked in your book like how do you invent the story of the god man right yeah it's it's got to be hard and there's some by the way the, the book I looked for other authors making the same arguments, and I had to go back 90, 100, 200 years. Right. Uh, no one's written this stuff lately. Mm -hmm. But um, a couple of good authors um, writing about the, 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 the whole problem of describing a God man and getting it right. How do you get it so that you've got, you realize that in the whole, from the arrest or even the Garden of Gethsemane, on through his crucifixion, Jesus was entirely human he was in pain he was in suffering he was hurting and yet all the way through there he was totally in control you, wow. you've got him totally Man. human and totally god all the way I through there it. that's got to be hard to invent as you know <laughs> if you're going to make up a legend that's got to be hard you think of um when he when he weeps over jerusalem right and, yeah. How often I long to, you know, but to gather you, but you wouldn't. Only a God would say, I wanted to gather you. Mm -hmm. And yet he's weeping. Yeah. You think of him at Lazarus' tomb. He's got all the power and he does it. And yet he weeps. He's mm. very, very human all the way through. Mm. And he never loses his God aspect ever. How did that's not balance by the way that's not like a you know 50 percent human 50 percent god that's all human all god all the way through I, you know the 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 literary genius who who invented that on his own would have to be better than shakespeare goethe dostoevsky sophocles I, I, and jk rowling put together i, I was have to put that i was <laughs> man I, 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 I was just about to say even if i wanted to make up that story i would while trying to say yeah he's 100 percent man 100 percent god i'm going to end up naming something that's imperfect you know it you know he's going to say yeah. i would end up having him say something that's you know that's it's like a bit too sarcastic and rude or something like that you know yeah. and, and a bit too mean and cruel but jesus had a way of of being a, incredibly blunt right and and even saying have you not heard you know like right. are you not paying attention but yet still there's there's dignity to these people as human beings but i'm calling you a hypocrite because that's what you are like there's a fine line that only god could <laughs> like no one could no no right. one can invent this because we would mess up ain't none of us that smart right the story doesn't fit the the skeptics backstory here their their backstory doesn't fit the story and so i think you know, when that happens, you, you got to say there's something wrong with the backstory. Can you come up with a better one? Um, I can. You know, <laughs> you, you know, as a, you know, as a non-believer, one of the questions 
that that Frank Turek asked that mm-hmm. that helped me out. Yeah. You know, so when skeptics are, you know, conversing with him, you know, sometimes he'll say, okay, well, if the first miracle that's recorded in the Bible, if that actually happened, all the other miracles are at least possible, right? And of right. course, he's talking about in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. So yeah. if there is, and I know, you know, my presuppositional brothers and sisters don't like posing this question when we're reasoning, mm-hmm. but if there is a God, who created everything out of nothing? If that's possible, raising somebody from the dead don't seem that outrageous no more, okay? Somebody right. surviving in the world doesn't sound that crazy no more when it comes to inventing everything. I'm talking gravity. I'm talking water, right. yeah. wind. I mean, <laughs> I mean, are, are, are you kidding me? Yeah, like, right. No big deal. Yeah, it's no big deal. But but if the athe- but if the atheists are right in this community of, of faith around the Mediterranean invented the story of Jesus, that would be very very miraculous. It would. Yeah, I, it, 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 or actually Philip Schaff said it. He said in this case the poets must be greater than the hero. Mm. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's you know, it's it's a couple of things, and I'm enjoying our conversation. It was a couple of things yeah. that I wanted to make sure okay. I touched on. You know, because, and again, in this book, you do a great job of touching on apologetics, but also making sure we have a good theological, you know, basis mm-hmm. and foundation for everything. You're really preaching the gospel right throughout the whole book, preaching Greatness the gospel Jesus. message. Yeah. And man, you mentioned something that I often say when I'm teaching Sunday school or doing things at my local church. You talk about how it has become so easy for us to take Jesus for granted. Yeah. And I, I, before I elaborate, I just kind of just want to hear you just, you know, uh, elaborate on on that. And then I'll, yeah. I'll respond. Well, I think the, the title for the book was almost Too Used to Jesus. That, too Used to Jesus would wow. have been the title. Wait, this one's better. But it, that's kind of the point is I think we're too used to Jesus. So we're not stunned by his greatness. We're not. We don't realize how how weird it is that he succeeded as a leader when he didn't admit mistakes, when he didn't ask his followers opinion. You're not going to succeed as a leader that way unless you're God. Um, And we don't recognize all the strange things about him um, that he never said our father. He did tell the disciples to, but he he, he kept himself separate. We don't notice how different he is. We don't notice how weird it is that he said, yeah, we're friends. No longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. We like that. The next verse, though, says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, you know, you try that with the next person that you meet on, 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 in class or at work. And say, yeah, we can be friends. You do what I command you. We've, Jesus is really different. And he's intentionally different. He's intentionally, di- he's, he's to be worshipped and yeah. loved and obeyed. And the fact that he loves us, that he does call us friends, is, is as much a miracle as anything else. I, so you just made me think of something in what you were saying about, about okay. Jesus saying things like yeah. that, you know, you, know, you know, commanding, you know, that, you know, he served mm-hmm. and things like that. Because we got to think, in 2020, you know, it's celebrities who, you know, who have large followings and sometimes people, people feel like, okay, like you're starting a cult. Like for instance, Beyonce, she just released the project and it has a lot of ancient, you know, religious, a- African religious stuff. And she actually takes really? shots at the Bible on, on, on some of her records as well. But even then, even if it's true that, you know, she's trying to stray people away and whatnot, she's not being as direct as what Jesus said, right? You know, it's, you know, the way humans do it is it's almost, it, it, not almost, it's manipulative, right? You know, it's, it's I'm going to show you this. It's, or really what, what Satan does, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, really what Satan, yeah. it's really what Satan does. You know, it's manipulative. We're going to get <laughs> you to get one inch to get you to be two or three inches. We're going to get you to be five or six inches. And then, we got you right here and hopefully we, you know, never let you go. Mm-hmm. So whether that's true with Beyonce or some other, you know, human leader, it always takes manipulation. 
it always right. takes, you know, right. yeah, good you know it always takes some sort of, you know, luring and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. It's not as direct as you, as you just said with Jesus' words, because it couldn't be unless you're God. Right. Yeah. And, and boy, was he not a manipulator when people started to leave him in John 6. Uh huh. Um, he turned to Peter and said, you're going to go too? <laughs> or he turned to all the disciples rather. And he said, you're going to go too? And Peter said, yeah, it, it was almost, you get the sense like Peter would have liked to, he, but his answer was, who else are we going to go to? You, you alone have the words of eternal life. Right. So he, I don't think it was any easier at that point than for the disciples than it was for everyone else who cut and ran. It's just that they were blessed enough, uh, graced enough, smart enough to, to stick with the words of eternal life. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So, again, you know, the book is too good to be false. Too good to be false. It's an excellent title. If you could summarize, and, you know, we got a few more minutes here. If yeah. you could, if if you could summarize, you know the the book and what people can learn from it. What would you say? What what would you say as it pertains to the book? Too good to be false. Yeah, well, let me start with part three, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is the challenges that people have to following Jesus. Like you know, the whole world says we shouldn't be exclusivists this way, and there's and there's people pressing on with without right persecution that's been worldwide, but it's growing in the U.S. Why would you follow Jesus? And my message in this book is that Jesus is, is, is so good. He is, his life, he, his, he, he was the one, lived the one perfect human life that's ever been lived. He died for our sins. He rose again. He, he, he calls us to be his friends. He calls us into relationship with him. And my goodness, the story is true. Amen. And and we can know it's true, partly because it's so good. And that's a. By the way, I've had several people who said, you know, when I heard you were going to try to write a book saying that the reason we know it's true is because it's so good, I was skeptical. I thought, you know, this is this isn't going to work. This argument isn't going to work because, you know, anyone can write a good story. But when they've read the book, they thought, mm, well actually not anyone can write a story this good so jesus is too good to be false and so we should follow him no matter what amen amen yes we should and i yeah. mean and the truth of the matter is we don't even deserve the right to follow him yet he is available you know for wicked folks and wretched folks like me you and whoever's listening to follow because we got to think man you know it's people it's great teachers it's great leaders who if we got them mad enough if we offended them enough they wouldn't even want us to you know to follow them i don't want you on my promo team i don't want you you know uh sharing my stuff you know instagram P celebrities do it all the time you know influ influencers do it all the time you said something crazy and now i get it you're trying to promote the last video i just did but i don't need that i don't because i don't yeah. need y what you bring around and mm -hmm. oftentimes we're celebrated for that to a certain extent is we, we might should do that because we're human and we're not God. But the fact is, Jesus don't do that to us. And he should because he don't need my wicked self. Yeah, he goes, Veda, Veda, I love you right. despite your wickedness. Matter of fact, I don't just love you in spite your wickedness. I'm going to make you as white as snow, as yeah. filthy as you are. My blood will have you white as snow. My God, who wouldn't serve a God like this, man? No, he is so good. He yes, is so he good. is. Yes. yes. Yes, he is. Well, again, Tom, you know, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I thoroughly enjoyed your book. I'm going to continue to read. Is there any uh, just last thoughts as it pertains to the book, anything that you're working on, any conferences you're doing or anything of that nature that you just kind of want to, you know, promote or share your thoughts on? Yeah, thank you. Um, place to find me is at the stream, stream.org, but for uh, things related to this book um, is thinkingchristian.net. I've been blogging there for years, 15, 16, I forget how many years. Um, thinkingchristian.net 
And I'd like you, I'd like you to read there, but I'm, I'm also looking for opportunities to share this message. So if your church, your uh, online in particular, but in person, a conference, uh, uh, anything like that, if there's any place where I can come and share with your group, go to Thinking Christian. You'll find links there where you can find me and, and invite me in. I'd, I'd just love to be there with you. Um, I, I want to talk about how good Jesus is, and I want to help people understand that. So that's, that would be my encouragement. I'm available to, to, to do that kind of thing. The book just came out officially two days ago. So there's plenty of room on a schedule at this point for that. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Thank you so much, Mr. Tom Gilson, for your time, for joining us here today on Is He A Real One Radio. But also thank you for sharing your your countless hours of study on this subject. You know, I'm certain it's, I'm certain that it's going to bless many. I'm sure it's already have blessed many because I know you have been doing interviews and, and blogs and stuff about it. And I'm sure that people have already been blessed. And prayerfully, this interview will help further that message, my brother. Thank you. Well, uh, I've enjoyed talking with you. Thanks. Amen. To God be the glory. Well, there's two things we like to say on, on this here radio. The first one is you may or may not be reformed, but we should all be informed. So be sure to check out this book. This will help you out in that and in your walk. And last but not least, we always ask, is he a real one? Yes, he is. And the he that we're talking about is Jesus, y'all. A-A-A-Man. Amen. Amen.